Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today Natasha Meikle and Lawrence Conley and I are delighted to be joined by Jared Hill. Now, Jared, you joined us in December for the, the big charity weekender and your podcast Celtic Down Under uh, did a one hour stint. So welcome back. How's it been over the last six months? Uh, it's been, uh, yeah, first of all, I just want to say thanks for having us on and um, back in December and also again tonight. But yeah, it's been interesting for us we've been coming out of summer just hitting winter and lockdown over here in melbourne again so i'm seeing pictures of people over in scotland going to pubs and, that, and i'm getting jealous so lucky you guys <laughs> well i've not actually been to a pub yet i don't know if natasha and lawrence have, have managed to do that um but <laughs> yes <laughs> one on to celtic down under uh your best place, Jared, let's be honest, your best place. Natasha and I were just talking here about yesterday, uh, the troops on the Monday Club, speaking about Ange Postacoglu. Um, there was a bit of criticism, I've got to say, after the show. It may have been quite one-sided, but you know what? That's their opinion, and that's what it's all about. But for the, the, the fairness of balance, I think it's only fair that we speak to someone who has seen the development of Ange within uh, the game over there, and give us a real insight. Also, we'll throw over some concerns as well, Natasha, because it's fair to say there's quite a few concerns been raised over the last few days, hasn't there? Mm, there certainly has. And I think a lot of it, like we've touched on, is lack of knowledge of Ange Postacoglu. I think for me, I'm quite happy to admit that I don't know a great deal about the A-League or the J-League so for us, I think it's important that we listen to people who do know those leagues before making judgments. What's interesting for me has been the fact that the vast majority of Celtic fans have responded negatively to this rumour and don't think that this Ange Postacoglu is the correct person for the job. But if we actually look at the smaller percentage of people who think he's a great appointment and could do very well for us, these tend to be the people who know him and know the A-League and know the J-League better. So for me, it's interesting that the people who actually know him and know the leagues he's worked in think he's a great candidate. So that's what I'm really looking forward to finding out more about today. At the same time, you know, I'm looking back through my own Celtic support and life, going back to going to the Games in 1987, and I'm thinking of all the different appointments that we've had since then. Billy McNeil being the first one, and so on. Some you've been happy with, Lawrence, some you were unhappy with, but one thing's for sure, you still went and supported Celtic, and that, that is undeniably going to be the, the fact whether or not it's Ange or A and other. Uh, that is not going to change. But you know what? It's okay to have that debate. I've seen a lot of people, Lawrence, talking about uh, the kind of criticism around the appointment of Vim Janssen. I've seen a lot of criticism around, um, you know, the arrival of Lubo Moravchik uh, because a big part of this, like Natasha says, it's all about how much do we really know about Ange and, you know, let's speak to people like Jared who can give us a wee bit more insight. Um, does it bring back shades of the Vim Janssen and the Lubo Moravchik reactions, Lawrence? Yeah, definitely, I think. Lugo, we're told we should be signing John Spencer instead. Uh, yeah, you know, one came in and done well. I, th I think part of the reaction is about how big a rebuild job he's got. Yeah. So, you know, with any new manager, there's risk. And I, I think we we recognise this is probably a huge job for any manager coming in, but bigger than rebuilding any manager's face before. And I think that's where a lot of the worry is coming from. The guy's a winner. You know, he wins things which is always a nice trade to have, especially if he's you know, going to be joining us. Uh, there's a lot of unknowns and, and people don't like unknowns, so hopefully Jared's going to enlighten us in a lot of this. You're here to allay all our fears, Jared. Now, I believe it's about half past nine over there at the moment uh, in the night time, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, yeah. You were telling us that you actually have been watching Ange at close quarters since you were about 14 years of age. Talk to us about his development and your experience of watching him um, in Australian football. Okay, so with Australian football, we've got the A-League, which everyone keeps referring to. But before that, if we scale it right back to when I first started watching him, when he took over in about 96, managing at South Melbourne. So the local Greek club in the NSL, because that's what the old NSL over here was, the National Soccer League. You had all the clubs that were founded by the expats. So you had your English clubs. You had Melbourne Knights, which is where Viduka did his development at, which is a Croatian club. You had, you know, your, your Italian clubs like Marconi and all that sort of stuff. So it was South Melbourne Hellas, and that's where all the Greeks were, and that's where Ange took over and he coached. And he had a 
He had a young squad, brought guys through, and a, a consistent theme that you'll see across his career is first year comes in, change it, lets the senior guys go, rejigs the squad. Second year, third year onwards, he has that success. Mm. And that was a, that's something back then that he let go of a few people and you're like, what's he up to? What's he doing here? These are guys who are ex-Socceroos, senior play, like respected people in the game. And to see him let them go and then still go on and win back-to-back NSL titles at South Melbourne, playing an aggressive, it's kind of like the Dutch total football, or as I refer to it, Lisbon Lions football before then, because I think total football was stolen from the Lisbon Lions, but different story for another day. But he plays that aggressive. And to make a little little jokey, you've got the title here, Ange Postacoglu, a case for the defence. His teams, it's not about the defence. If they can see three, they're going to score four. That's the mindset. So, you know what? When you're talking about Lisbon Lions, there, I, I totally agree with that. Uh, the total football came after it, so good shout there, and But that that is interesting because we do talk about the the old romanticism uh, around free flowing, uh, fast attacking, exciting football, uh, Natasha. And uh, although it's refreshing to hear that, by God, we need a defence, don't we? We do. It's certainly been a weak point from this season, but if. You ask Celtic fans what sort of football they want the team to play. It is that attacking, free-flowing, goal-scoring football that we want to see our team play. And if that's what Ange Postacoglu's motto is, if that's the sort of philosophy of football that he has, this, if you score three, we'll score four, four. I like that. I do like that. And I think that is a bit more synonymous with what Celtic try to do in terms of playing that attacking football. One thing that I was interested in that maybe Jared can help elaborate on a bit is whether he is going to be the right man to get us through this rebuild. It's something you touched on there that he came into the team, got rid of a lot of the older players, brought a lot of new players in. And one thing that I was reading about him was that in 2013, he takes over the Australia squad. And at that time, the Australia squad needed a massive overhaul. It was an ageing team. There wasn't a lot of youth players coming through and they were sticking with sort of tried and tested old guard. And it was him that came in and implemented a new plan and a new style, changed it from defensive to attacking. Do you see any similarities in the overhaul that he did to the Australia squad when he took over and the overhaul that he might have to do to the Celtic squad he And will that experience help him if he comes into this role? It's not just the Australia squad that you're looking at. He's done this everywhere. He did it at South Melbourne in the 90s. Then he went to the Australian News set up for seven years, qualified for World Cup, so it's constantly developing and bringing through players. Then from there, he went to Brisbane Raw. We skipped that mm. season in Greece because he was unemployable technically at that point because of the way his national team youth set up fell, fell apart. That was just, yeah, that, to me, knowing the sort of guy he is and the way he's bounced back, I can write that off because a lot of managers, you see Neil Lennon in the media this year, I wouldn't be stressing about that. But then to go on to where he went to Brisbane Raw and he went in there and he cut guys like Danny Tiado, an ex-Man City player. Mm. He, there was other guys there he cut, brought through the youth, won back-to-back titles, an Australian professional sport record of 36 straight winning games, like straight wins. To then leave that club, to come down to my local club in the Alec that I'm a season ticket holder of Melbourne Victory come back home to Melbourne for a season, signed a three-year deal. Now, that's the one club that he's managed in his professional career that he hasn't won a league title at. However, he did one year there, then he got headhunted for the Australian national team. The following season, those guys that he recruited at Victory won the league in 2015. So it was his squad that went on to win it the following year. He's worked playing his type of football. Sitting there, week in, week out, watching that team. Victory, the biggest team in the A-League in terms of um, support, membership, all that sort of thing. So similar to Celtic. The way he come in, let guys go, brought in his squad, it's a similar sort of rebuild to what we're going through now at Celtic in terms of mm. older players moving on, bring through youth, sign players, recruiting, all that sort of stuff to put, put a new squad together. So he's got that experience there. On top of that, as we touched on before we went live, then when he went into the Australia team, and you mentioned it, he let go a lot of the senior pros. He kept pretty much one guy, Tim Kale, as an attacker, one experienced midfielder, 
one experienced centre back and experienced goalkeeper, and then brought the young kids, or not the young kids, but the youth through, other guys through, and build a squad. We were struggling to get twenty fit players for the national team over his two World Cup, the World Cup in twenty fourteen, and then his whole qualifying process the following year or the following four years. He brought through and built that squad up to where. I think it was close on 45 to 50 players had made their debut and he built a talent pool and everyone could just come in. It was next man up, which is what we need to have at Celtic. Mm. You look at this year, a guy got injured. <laughs> was there people there ready to step in? No. So he's good at building things. No, it's a good point because you look at where we were in January. Um, we're having to bring in almost an emergency loan so that we've got a right back after selling Frimpong. Uh, next season is going to be the first season where we have the Colts and you hope that that is going to have that gradual progress from the Colts level up to the, the first team. So if, if, he's, if he's building teams and he's building clubs, that's what I like to hear. Other things I've been hearing and I've been hearing them all, all morning this morning are players who have first hand experience of working with them. Um, and it's incredible how they are waxing lyrical. Even the guys who were freed, as you say, he's gone in, he's freed a lot of kind of experienced players. I'm going to pull in some of the comments that are coming in and they're relevant to some of the concerns that a lot of Celtic fans have at the moment. First and foremost, Patrick Murphy. We're talking about Postacoglu as if we have sealed the deal. This is Celtic we're talking about here. The idea we're well running professional is to some extent a myth. We're only a big club in name. Listen, I take nothing for granted now um, after what happened with Eddie Howe. And there's rumblings yesterday that already there are clubs in the EPL uh, looking to bring him in. Everton have been mentioned um, and I'm sure others will be interested as well. Now, there are also um, some concerns around the backroom staff. So Highland Paddy comes in. Welcome to the show. No talk about a backroom staff. Kennedy will be his number two. Depressing times ahead. I've also seen the story, don't know how much truth is in it, around Sean Maloney returning to the club in some capacity. Now, when you look at that, Jared, is that a concern? Because obviously that was the environment in which Neil Lennon entered and it was an environment that I don't think did him any favours. He didn't have his own backroom team. Would that be a, a, an issue for Ange if he was to come in? Absolutely, it'd be an issue. He's, he's not backwards and coming forwards. He's very... Let's just say he's very Australian in that regard. We say what we think and if we upset people too bad in general. So he's he comes across a bit a bit prickly and a bit bit of a bit of a prick basically. He can come across that way, but yeah, I think it'd be an issue. He'd be every club he's gone to, he's put together his own staff. I don't mm -hmm. see it. He did it at the Socceroos, he did it at Victory, he did it at Brisbane, he's done it at South Melbourne, he's gone to Japan and his backroom staff, the majority of them are Australian. And then he's got translators on the pitch with him. Now that's gonna he's got four different translators on the pitch and he just says what he wants. Everything's timed, all trainings happen, and he's got his translators doing the that for him. He's not gonna go into a club and just be dictated to. Mm. So I don't see that being an issue for him because if he doesn't want Kennedy there or Strachan there, they won't be there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big concern, Natasha. I mean, um, Jared has referred to him as a prick. I've been called a lot worse in the last week, so that's fine. You can use that. That's no problem at all. Uh, what other concerns do you have, Natasha, around the possible appointment of Ange Postacoglu? One that keeps coming up, and I'm not sure it's one that I buy into, is that he has managed in the A-League and the J-League. And it's been talked about as if those leagues aren't at the quality we need for a Celtic manager. They want someone from a better European league. They want someone from the English league. My response to that is obviously that, you know, the Scottish league is no La Liga itself. But for a club like Celtic, should we be aiming higher than someone who only has A-League and J-League experience? And what would you say that the standards of that league are at now, Jared? I was talking to someone yesterday, a journalist based in Tokyo, who thinks that the J-League is in the top 10 leagues in the world. Now, for me, I don't know that. I don't watch the J-League, so I can't have a comment on that. What sort of standard do you think it's at? What sort of league would you compare it to? Well, a perfect question, that, because I've been growing up watching Scottish football since I was a kid. been watching Australian football for years, pretty much going back, as I said, to the 90s. And I've got a guy on my podcast who's based over in Japan. And so we've been having these conversations in our group mm. chat anyway. So this year in the A-League, because of COVID and because of lockdowns and that, a lot of teams have not have actually gone and brought through the youth in the A-League. So at the moment, 
the A League would be weaker than the Scottish top tier, it'd probably be championship level in Scotland. However, when Ange was managing here, and that's what I'm going to refer mm -hmm. back to, when he was at Brisbane Raw and before he took the Australia job, those teams back then, the top four teams over here in a salary cap league, would have easily been competing for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth in the Scottish Premier League, in my opinion. Easily at that level. There would have been teams there like Brisbane and Sydney, for instance, that would have been challenging for the second. If Rangers weren't there, second. Otherwise, third and fourth position. So it's a decent standard. Then when you go to the J League at the moment, what I'm, been, what I'm hearing is, and from what I've been watching recently, because, well, I want to watch football in the off-season, the J League's on, let's keep watching that, is it's a league where seven, to, seven or eight teams a year could win the comp. Mm. And the club that Ange is at has got like the 12th or 13th lowest wage bill in the league. Mm. Yet, when he first came in, they come 12th after half a season or whatever. Then they won the comp for the first time in 15 years with a really low wage bill. There's probably six or seven teams in that league that would at least be better than the bottom six in the Scottish Premier League. So if there's your comparison from what I'm seeing, mm. I think it, I'm not as stressed about it. Personally, I would rather, I've still got my thoughts on who I want and the setup I want at the club. Mm -hmm. But if Ange comes in and say you bring in Fergal Harkin, for instance, as director of football, because that's what I want, I want a director of football and a coach, then I'm happy with Ange doing that because he doesn't have to focus as much on the on the recruitment side of it, which is the biggest issue I'm hearing at the moment. Is he doesn't know mm -hmm. British football. He doesn't know mm -hmm. the Scottish League. So that's my main thing there. Lawrence, when you look at, uh, as as Jared was just saying there, he's not too stressed about it. There has been an incredible amount of stress in amongst the Celtic support recently. How much do you think that played a part in the reaction when Ange Postacoglu's name started to become linked with the Celtic job? It was on the back of the How deal collapsing at the 11th hour. Celtic fans already uh, were feeling uh, as though we were too late in appointing a manager and then the one that apparently was the prime candidate falls by the wayside. How much of the reaction is actually down to other factors in the timing of the of the connection between Ange and Celtic's managerial position? Listen, if we'd won 10 in a row, we're doing a change now and Ange was coming in, I don't think it'd be anywhere near as adverse a reaction. So uh, everything's always a reaction to the situation. And yeah, just the way with it, things have ended with how there's already a disconnect between the supporters and the board. Mm -hmm. It's not made it any better, has it? You, you know, so trust is probably a low low point between the supporters and the board. Yeah. How falling out of bed, it's not made that any better, the, the, the trust issues. So I think it's a huge factor in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, when you read it, we post a Coglu's record on paper. You're thinking, well, the guy's a winner. He brings through young players. He builds squads. He plays attacking football. He plays aggressive attacking football. What would you like about that? And if it's just simply saying, well, A-League and J-League's not good. You know, how many people have actually watched the A-League and J-League that are saying the A-League and the J-League's not good? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of, are they not good just because you don't watch them? Or are they not good because you've watched them and decided they're not off the standard? Listen, you know, on the flip side, this could be a really exciting, adventurous appointment. You're bringing in a winning manager who's got a track record about bringing, developing young players mm -hmm. and developing winning, winning teams. What what about that, wouldn't you like? Is it the fact he's not from the EPL or La Liga or Italy or Germany? Is that just the only worry? We've spoken loads on this podcast, actually, Jared, about the perception around players, managerial appointments, anything to do with Celtic, actually. Um, you know, there, there is a perception around it. Sometimes it's uh, negatively viewed. And I think that some of the examples you could look at, I guess, are, you know, 21 years ago today, we appointed Martin O'Neill. Um, but when you think back to who his successor was, it was Gordon Strachan. And I, I think back to those times, and there was a huge sense, I think, back then of, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I felt as though it was a downgrade at that point from Martin O'Neill to Gordon Strachan. Strachan went on to win 
uh, three league titles. Strachan went on to take us into the Champions League last 16 on two occasions and he proved me and others wrong. But there was that perception, you look at Strachan and you think, well, he only ever managed two games in Europe before he came to Celtic. Um, you look at the clubs he had managed, but potentially at that time, unfashionable clubs. So I, I'd take all that on board. The perception angle is one that can skew your, your, your view on it. One thing I'm a wee bit concerned about is uh, I've been talking about, you know, hearing some players who have worked with them and they say, well, you know, year one's almost as though he's finding his feet, but year two is where it all kicks into gear. And as you know, we're about 50 days away from our Champions League qualifier. Um, any of the three opponents are going to cause us problems, I think. You know, and he's got to hit the ground running. Is that a concern for you, Jared? Or did you think that, you know, that was maybe um, a, a part of Angie's managerial career that was him finding his feet as a manager? Is that something that you have no concerns about? Oh, I'll be honest, I've got some concerns, but the the concern, reason for the concern isn't what most people would think. Like, my co reason for my concern is because... It's not Ange. It's the fact that if we went with, a, say, a director of football and brought Ange in as the coach two, three months ago, fine. My concern at the moment is, as you said, 50 days or whatever it is till the first qualifier. That's what my concern is. By sitting on Eddie Howe for so long and not doing something and saying, giving him a time frame and saying, no, nah, you're done, Eddie. This isn't going to happen. And going ahead with this option, that's what my concern is because the Scottish League, realistically, it's a two-horse race. It's us and Rangers. We're going to have, even though we let guys are moving on, we're going to have a stronger squad. We've got a bigger wage budget than the other 10 other teams in the league. Pretty much every team in the league with a bigger wage budget. So I'm not worried about his recruitment and getting things set up. I'm more worried about him having the time to set that up and get the players fit enough, especially mm -hmm. off the back of Euros as well, and then getting it there. Because he's, with how unfit our team was last year, we struggled to run out 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the way Ange likes to play, high energy, press, 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 and counter press. It's massive difference in the amount of minutes you're going to have to get in your legs on the training pitch to be fit enough to play that. See, the big thing for me is <clears throat> you're looking at some of the players that he might revitalise. I think the obvious one uh, is going to be Tommy Rogic. Do you think, I've already kind of written him off. I, I would expect Tom Rogic to leave this, this pre-season. Do you think he's the type of player who could be resurrected by his countrymen? Tommy was um, an interesting one because the old joke was Tom Rogic only has one lung. Like, he's not a very fit player. <laughs> and with the way the way Poster Cogaloo's teams play, he doesn't look like on paper he fits that. But then when you'd see him play for Australia, it was a very structured way that we press. Like, the ball goes to a certain area and then the winger would press up and the striker would fall back. So the, the guy playing in the 10 roll didn't have to run anywhere near as much as you think he'd have to as a press. So it actually would mask some of Tommy's weaknesses. So it could work. But at the same time, I don't see Tommy Rogic getting in that role in the team in front of David Turnbull. No, I'd agree with that. I, after the season we've just seen, and you know, I was very disappointed. I'm a big fan of Tom Rogic, and I was very disappointed with his uh, lack of game time and his lack of impact, really, uh, throughout the season. Overall, there's a few other points I want to, to raise with you, Jared, but overall, I'm getting the sense that you feel a lot of the criticism is unfair on this potential new manager. It's, it's not unfair. I think it's more fear of the unknown from mm. everyone. And that's what the main issue is. Like, If I would had no idea who he was, I would probably feel the same way. I'd be like, who's this guy? Who, who we linked with him? But because of the history there where I've seen his teams play since way back in 96, my sister-in-law's ex-husband was cut from the Socceroos by Ange when he came in before the 2014 World Cup, and I've seen and heard stories on that side of it. I know the sort of character he is. I know it's not going to phase him going into the club and rebuilding and doing everything he needs to. I think the biggest issues for me, as it was touched on earlier about the standard of the J-League, the standard of the A-League, the biggest thing for me is I'm seeing a lot of... Um, this might be a little controversial, but I'm seeing a lot of people saying he's not of the standard because they don't know him. Yet, mm -hmm. how many times do you hear English fans saying the Scottish thing's a farmer's league? Mm -hmm. Yet, mm -hmm. the Scottish fans over there are doing the exact same thing about the J League and the A League. Over here, it's known as the world game for a reason because it's not just played in Europe. 
And in the old NSL days, they had this thing called Euro snobs because it was people who, no matter what happened in the local league over here, those people go, oh, I'm not going to bother go and watch the NSL because I've got a Man United game I can watch on TV or I've got an EPL game. So there was always, the local league was always put down. So we've got that chip on our shoulder over here as Australians in terms of football in the same way that Scot the Scottish people do re relating to the EPL. So I can see that that theme and that narrative coming out in a lot of people's questions more mm. because it's the fear of the unknown rather than who is he. Absolutely. The other thing I was going to ask is obviously if he is to be the new manager of Celtic, he's entering uh, the Goldfish Bowl, the, the famous Goldfish Bowl of Glasgow that doesn't only take in the support, it brings in the media. It's a 24-7 uh, occupation uh, at Celtic or Rangers. Um, I've heard people saying he doesn't suffer fools. You've said yourself that uh, you know he, he certainly his teams like to play aggressively. Is there an issue with uh, temperament that might um, clash with uh, the kind of Scottish, the culture of Scottish football? He's the sort that would tell someone you don't just be shut up. You don't know what you're talking about in a press conference. <laughs> he's not going to sit there and cop it. He's they say he's the Aussie Bielsa for that exact reason, and the way his teams play and the way he comes across with the media. We've had, he's had major issues with this guy, Craig Foster, who's massive in our football media over here for years. He's had other, those two just never got along. But then you've had him with other guys where there's been clashes, but that, but he's a really switched on operator. You get a few press conferences, you understand he knows what he's talking about and he's not going to tolerate crap, basically. If someone's asked him a dumb question in a press conference, like the stuff we see a lot of the time from, was it the uh, Five Live team and, the BBC guys, other other Michael Stewart, you know, the rest of them, they'll ask some dumb <laughs> questions. He'll clap right back at him and I can't wait to see it. Natasha, you're on the press conferences next season. I hope you're looking forward to them. Um, I absolutely can't wait. That sounds, that sounds exactly what we need. Why should we just answer these questions that we get from the media without challenging them? If we can get someone who can come in and challenge the narrative of the media, who can call them out when they ask stupid questions, who can call them out when they are being slightly slanted one side or the other. Um, yeah, let's get someone who can call them out. I think that he's exactly what we need in Scottish football. It sounds like he'll be a breath of fresh air from the media side of things in a way, and certainly no issues with him being that sort of character. I think it'll help, and we hear this sort of narrative that he's part of the City group, mm. and there's still the Lawwell links there, and that he's going to be another yes man and that he won't get to choose his own backroom team, that will all be given to him, and that he's going to be a puppet. Everything Jared is telling me says that this couldn't be further from the truth. He is not going to be a yes man. Australians aren't yes men by nature, as Jared has told us. Is that something you agree with, Jared? And do you have any concerns about him being a yes man for the board? Not really, because I actually don't think he's a, he's a Peter Lawwell appointment. I think he's a Fergal Harkin appointment. That's... Mm. I honestly think Harkins coming in as the director of football is going to be who do you want as the manager? And because he's in the city group as the pathways manager and he's dealing with loaning guys out to these clubs, he's known Ange. Pep Guardiola's given Ange a good rap as well because they played friendlies against him. You've mm -hmm. got those guys that have know him and know what he's like. Oh, and let's be all announced. I said on a podcast we recorded yesterday, but I'm like, you're going to have Don Mackay sitting in the press conference with Ange Foster Coglu on one side and and Fergal Harkin on the other, and that's your, that's your lineup. And he's not going to have to be a yes man because he knows those guys. They brought him in. I think if Peter Law was still Lawwell was still involved and he was getting in his ears, and you have to do this, you have to do that. And just a sort of turn around, flip my bird, and say, "Jam it." <laughs> I'm liking the sound Good. of that. I've got to say, yeah, absolutely, I can support that. The big, the big question, I guess, now is, uh, Lawrence, I'll come to you first. Um, it looks as though this is the road Celtic are going down. I take on board the comment there that you, you can't quite believe it until you see it these days with Celtic. Um, if not, Ange, then who? Because, I mean, th there is also that question of we're, you know, very, very close to the first game, a very tough qualifier regardless of who we're playing. And we've... We claim to have done a lot of work on the deal to bring Postacoglu to the club, as well as um, how that deal falls by the wayside. We focus on um, our alternative. I'm not going to call him our second. Uh, I'm going to call him our alternative. If it doesn't happen, who do we turn to then? We were a bit of the way down the road with, was it Keenan Buck coming in? 
there's been rumours about Maloney. So I, I think there's still quite a few people that we've spoken to, but it would, it would appear that, yeah, that Angie's going to be the man or he's the preferred candidate now. But there's other people out there. Obviously, your friend Mark Hughes. Uh, I don't know if the club's going to decide to speak to him or not. But, you know, the guy only lost the Man City job because he wasn't the best coach in the world. <laughs> it's, you know, he's a solid coach. There are options out there. It's just uh, whether uh, we'd work within the parameters Celtic are going to set them. Uh, and I think that's the big worry a lot of Celtic fans have. How involved is Peter Lowell? Mm -hmm. Do we genuinely have a new setup, or is it just you know a new coat of paint in the front door and still all the structural problems with the setup? Because if you know if nothing changes and the manager's not picking his backroom staff, get little saying the recruitment you know just presented with a list of three targets and that's it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's kind of the changes we're needing. Yeah. It's interesting you brought in the Nicky Bot, um, the, the name of Nicky Bot, because obviously that was that was a name that was linked a wee while back. It was Fergal Harkin, Roy Keane, Nicky Bot, uh, and it's been confirmed that Nicky Bot actually has spoken to the club uh, all around that at some stage during this process as well. So, you know, Roy Keane, I'm not sure if he admitted it or if it was Martin O'Neill, one of the two said that Keane had spoken to the club. I think that was another option. Um, I don't think it would be a particularly um, well-accepted uh, option. Natasha, we've seen a lot of the chat around Roy Keane. Um, personally, I don't think that's what Celtic need right now. Uh, but what about yourself? If this deal was to fall down, and I'm not being negative here, where, where do we go after that? Because... There is even the suggestion that we play that first game. If we can't get the deal for Ange over the line, John Kennedy's in that dugout. I think it shows how far we've come from being certain that Howe was our man to now even being considering Kennedy and Keane again. And that's a real issue. A couple of months ago, if you mentioned those names to the Celtic fans as a potential next manager, the majority of them would have laughed and said, not a chance. What's happened now is that we've went so far down the line with how for that to have fallen through at the last minute, other potential targets like Maresca have moved on elsewhere. And I don't want to use the phrase scraping the bottom of the barrel to see what's left, but it almost feels like that if you're looking at Keane and Kennedy. It's very clear that they were never the first choice option or probably not the second, third or fourth either. But we're looking to find ourselves in the position. What if that's all that's left? Do we just take them? And that's never a position that a club like Celtic should find themselves in. And the concern I have with either of those appointments, and to an extent Postacoglu as well, is by Celtic releasing that statement about Eddie Howe, whoever comes in next knows that they're not the second choice. If it's Postacoglu, he knows that he was perhaps second choice. If it's Keane or Kennedy, they know that they were third or fourth choice. So my concern is that for whoever comes in into the role now, they're going to be scrutinised under this lens of, well, you're not Eddie Howe. Eddie Howe wouldn't have dropped points there. Eddie Howe would have made that work. Eddie Howe would have done this. So whoever comes in is always going to be fighting against this narrative of not being the first choice and not being the calibre of manager that Eddie Howe is. And I think that's going to put whoever it is off to a difficult start. The encouragement that I've taken from this conversation today is Posta Coglu doesn't sound like the kind of guy that's going to let that bother him. He sounds like the kind of guy who's just going to come in and get a job done. So I think that'll help. But from the fans' perspective, there is still going to be that lingering feeling that he is number two. Mm. Yeah, I, I think so, Jared. And I think that um, it's a good point because when Brennan Rogers left and due to the success that he had had, circumstances he left under, Neil Lennon comes in and he was on a very short leash with the Celtic support because then you're thinking, well, that, that player wouldn't have uh, been as unfit under Brendan Rodgers. I heard that uh, being said time and time again or we'd have had better shape under Brendan Rodgers and you do, or the culture, we, we kept hearing about the culture under Brendan Rodgers, you do get that. Um, it sounds to me, like Natasha says though, Jared, that you know, I don't think that's going to bother him. But there's another manager who we'll probably talk about later on in the show who has completely embraced what Celtic are all about, and that's Fran Alonso, who's obviously managing the women's team. He speaks, he's got so much charisma, so much passion for the club. Um, are we going to see much of that, do you think, from uh, Ange if he was to come in? Firstly, Fran Alonso, what a suit game. I just want to quickly say that. 
Absolutely. Oh, yeah, but <laughs> and he'll embrace it. He always does that. He's one of those guys. You get a win or after the game, he'll go over to the active support, wave wave him up, sort of thing. Started a whole thing at at clubs where after the game, a go raises that wave, like hey, 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 to the active support, cheering each other, that sort of stuff. Locks to engage with the fan base and that. So it's, I think, he's probably more along the lines of what Fran Alonso is doing than what Neil Lennon was doing last season. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I'm. I think he'll he'll fit in well. But the only issue or concern I have is Martin O'Neill always said you're three losses away from getting the sack at Celtic, and because of what happened with Eddie Howe, and just going to cop it as soon as we drop points. And mm-hmm. I can tell he's not hiding to nothing, but he, that's not going to phase him. His personality type, he's not going to give two hoots. He'll just get on with it. That's good to hear. It, it is good to hear. One final thing, uh, perhaps selfishly, I would guess, is I've heard a lot of uh, fans who are based in Australia and, you know, they've got a massive fan base out there who don't get to see the club, Jared. You really don't. I mean, I know in the past there was Australian tours and um, it's difficult, isn't it, with the fixtures uh, and all that kind of thing. Um, is there a, a wee bit of you thinking, oh, we're going to claim a bit of Celtic here by having the gaffer in charge and he's, he's obviously representing? Oh, that's... Something when I told my wife about, about the link, she was just, she's like, oh, that'd be great. I'll actually, you, you'll hear about him in the newspaper. You'll actually get a bit more uh, TV time. You, and I'm like, yeah, but the best thing will be if somehow we can get in, like we win the league this year, we get straight into the Champions League group stages, then we'll be playing on Saturdays. Then it's on. Then the games will be shown on TV. Then we'll be able to get back out to the CSCs and have a sing song and carry on like we like to do. But when you're in the Europa League and you're playing on a Sunday night, when... The time zone changes to 11 hours different and you get a midday kickoff, it's 11 p.m. or you get a 3 p.m. kickoff. It's just a nightmare trying to watch the games over here. So all I've got to say is if Ange gets the job on that, that perspective, it will be great for us, us Aussie Celtic fans over here. But I want what's best for the club. Celtic's in my blood. It's been there my whole life. I want what's best for the club above all else. So I still personally have my opinion on who I wanted in the role mm-hmm. and he's still available. But I always wanted, I wanted, you mentioned about Mark Hughes and them a while ago. But for me, it was always, I wanted David Webb as director of football and I wanted David Wagner as manager. That's what I wanted coming in. If Ange, if they don't get it and Ange comes in, I know he can do the job. So I'm happy with that too. No, it's excellent. And will you come back on if the announcement is made, Jared? Will you come back on a Celtic state of mind? Sure thing. Brilliant. I really look forward to that. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I really appreciate your input. No problems. Thanks for having me. Good, Jared. That was excellent. A, a brilliant insight. Natasha, I'm going to come to you okay. first. Right, we've gone into this. We've heard the Monday Club's views yesterday, mm. which, by the way, are the views of many Celtic fans. We're not the, the, view, it's not the views of all Celtic supporters. We don't speak for the fan base, but there's a lot of criticism going on around this appointment. We've now got the the other side of the coin. It's been flipped. Has mm. it changed your perception at all in, in the race for Ange Postacoglu? Do you know what? The more I read about him and the more I hear about him, the more encouraged I get. And that, today from Jared, has helped that no end. Mm. I think what we acknowledged at the start of the show is that we need to listen to people who know better than we do about things. I think that's something that people might find difficult in all aspects of life. But if somebody knows more about something than you do, listen to them, soak it up. You don't have to agree with them. Just take that knowledge on board so that your opinion is then an informed opinion. If anyone has listened to that today and still thinks Costa Coglu is nowhere near the man for the job, that's absolutely fine. But by listening to these people and having more information on him, then you can make and form that opinion on him. Simply disregarding him because of the league he's come from or because you haven't heard of him before or you don't know how to say his name, that's not enough of a reason to assume that he will fail at Celtic. Take everything on board. Do I think it's a risk? Yes, I still think there are elements of risk there. I still think there are concerns. But for me, everyone we are now being linked with has an element of risk and has an element of concern. Nobody is universally going to think that Keane is the right man for the job. Nobody thinks that Kennedy is the right man for the job. There is risks with both of those appointments and there's risks with Foster Coglu. I think what we saw with Howe was that he was someone that the fans universally thought was the right man for the job and one that really sort of united people in their view that yes, he can come in and is the calibre of manager we need. I think everyone that's left, everyone that's now in the frame, there isn't that sort of universal view on anyone. 
If it is Postacoglu, then Celtic fans will get behind them. They will. I just see it going, it's it's on a knife edge. If we appoint Postacoglu, I really feel it could go one way or the other. We could get complimented for taking this risk and it massively paying off and we've tapped into a new market and a new nationality of manager and new leagues and found, you know, a real sort of rough diamond there who's going to come on and improve the team. Or it goes the other way. And people say, well, I told you that was never going to work. And you don't know until you've tried something. And for me, still risks there, but I'm certainly more encouraged after speaking to Jared today. Lawrence, you know, when you look at the situation we're in um, and without using it as a, a reason to, to beat the board again, it's difficult not to really. That we're sitting here this late on in the process and the board have led us to this point. Now, all you ever hear is the decision-making process. You hear Dermot Desmond, you hear Peter Lowell. Very soon, the name Lowell will be replaced by Dominic Mackay. You never hear about the other people responsible for the big decisions at Celtic Football Club. You never hear anyone calling out Ian Bank here and his uh, part to play in the decision-making process at Celtic. Isn't it about time there was a wee bit more responsibility um, kind of taken by people like Bank here, et al? Yeah, I think so. I mean... We've been calling for boardroom change, you know, those rumours of Ross Desmond coming on board at boardroom level. No matter what way you look at it, even outside of football, there's something seriously went wrong and has been going on for a number of years. Whether you get ses- successful managers like Martin O'Neill and Brendan Rodgers deciding they can't stay and work with the club, and even Lenny first time round, what it out. We've never addressed that. You know, it's just a symptom of the problem that the managers, successful managers want to leave. What, what, what's the problems within the club where we're driving away successful managers? Um, I, I, the, the main worry for me is that these will remain unaddressed. You know, we, we might bring in a, Ange, and unless we really do changes the, the way that the board works and the structure works, two or three years down the line, you could be hitting the same problem. You know, Natasha, when you look at the fact that I say the word fact, I'll be criticised for that. Um, We have interviewed others. We've spoken to the likes of Roy Keane, um, who would be backed up by Nicky Butt. I know that the papers are telling us it's Damien Duff. But um, is that a box ticking exercise? Is this uh, a Peter Lobel production? And he's always had his eye on the the City Group uh, candidate. I don't know. Um, it sounds like Celtic don't do that box ticking exercise, especially when they appointed Neil Lennon. It doesn't seem to be one that they tend to go down. What it looks like to me, which is a big concern, is that we've put all our eggs in one basket in here and we've been absolutely sure that he is the man and they have spent three months trying to get him. And they didn't manage to do that. And by really focusing on him, they failed to you know, risk manage. They fail to plan for the situation whereby how it doesn't happen. And they find themselves in this situation now, on the 1st of June, still scrambling around trying to find a manager. Maybe I'm doing them a disservice. Maybe there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes. Maybe they had done their due diligence. Maybe this was the backup plan to how. It certainly doesn't look like it. Um, so I'll... I'll give them the credit, maybe it has been happening, but from the fans' perception, it doesn't look like it. And that's such a key issue because we all know, we've talked about at length on here, there's a real issue in the relationship between the board and the fans at the moment. The worst thing that could happen for that relationship was that how deal collapsing at the last minute like it did. Do you know what? It might not have been solely the board's fault. It may be that Eddie Howe was playing us all along and waiting for a better option to come up through England. The way that the relationship is between the board and the fans at the moment, the board are going to take the wrath of this deal falling through from the fans. So now anything that they're doing in terms of trying to bring a new manager in, it just looks a little bit unprepared and it looks Mm. like they hadn't plans for this. No, you're right. John Curl actually comes in, or sorry, John Curry. The word straws and clutching come to mind, to use a Chris Sutton uh, expression. It looks as though Lawrence Celtic have had their pants pulled down at the last minute by Eddie Howe, who uh, would not surprise me if he's announced as a manager of someone like Everton over the the coming weeks. Uh, We shouldn't, as a club, be allowing ourselves to be in that position, though, surely? 
No, de- definitely not. You know, even if he's the chosen candidate, there should be some stronger commitment by the time we went to him and went, right, you're the, the guy that we want. Uh, that process needs to be closed really quickly. And obviously it wasn't closed. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, um, you know, there's rumours of a memorandum of understanding or whatever. That's not signing a contract. <laughs> you, you need to get him signed up to a contract. Uh, and the fact that it's bizarre that people that do so well in business were willing to let that one so long without the guy put his name to a contract. Mm. If he's unwilling to put his name to a contract, there's definitely a reason behind that. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and we didn't iron that out or, or bottom it out. You've, you've got to get that commitment, don't you? You've got to get that commitment, yeah. Lawrence. And th- this is a big thing. If indeed <clears throat> the appointment is Ange Postecoglou, will the Eddie Howe deal, the collapse of the Eddie Howe deal, be the final insult in the, uh, you know, the, when you're looking back on the legacy of Peter Lowell? Do you think that's a bit unfair or do you think that's what a lot of Celtic fans will be thinking, Natasha? You know, I think the way that it has went the last year, the last couple of years, everything good that Lawwell has done for the club, and it is in there, it is in there, he has done good for the club, but it is all going to be so tarnished by what has happened over the last couple of years. To me, it does just look like someone who has stayed in a job for too long, and that's why CEOs have a much shorter turnover period than we saw Lawwell have. And I think now Celtic fans, looking back on it, are going to focus on the deals that we didn't get over the line. The ones like Eddie Howe, even in terms of players, Tony, it's always going to be that. And the John McGinn saga, it's that that's going to be Peter Lawwell's sort of legacy, I think. Unfortunately for him is that people are going to look back on these and pinpoint the blame on him. Apparently he was far too involved in all the negotiations. Apparently he is the reason they all broke down. And there's so many instances you can point to, be it McGinn, Tony, Howe, that these could all have went and done very well for the club and that we managed to make it fall at the final hurdle and Lawwell is the one taking the blame for that. And I think looking back on things, that won't be forgotten very easily. Mm. We talk about the PR at the club, um, the club having to go on a charm offensive. Um, We won't go back too far, Lawrence, but let's go back to January where we were at an all-time kind of low in terms of the mood around Celtic, the Dubai debacle, all that kind of thing. And you were looking at that situation thinking, well, the club really need to start building bridges here. Um, But it seems to be a comedy of errors ever since then, to the point where we're running out of time. Um, And it always brings me back to that scene in Wallace and Gromit with a dog that's on the train, but there's no train tracks and he's laying them as the train is hurtling along. That seems to be, for me, what the Celtic board are doing at the moment. So Ange I think it's going to be difficult for Celtic fans to look at Ange Postecoglou um, through a fair uh, perspective because of what's happening in the background. I mean, it really has been a, a catastrophe uh, all season, but particularly since January. Listen, if, if Eddie Howe gets a job down, down south and loses his first five games and Ange is the man and wins his first five games, you know, it might be good to dodge the bullet there. But I totally agree that it's... Uh, there seems to be a complete lack of forward planning or any process. It just absolutely always seems to be reactive, always behind the story. We spoke about it on Dubai Celtic were well, two weeks in the response to what Neil Lennon uh, alleged was the government changing the rules on Celtic, something the government still haven't denied. But you're going, well, where's the Celtic PR in this? Where is this? This is something definitely they could have built some kind of relation with it, the fans with coming out stronger but the, the PR seems um, almost non-existent really doesn't it it's just at times you just see me release statements and wait to see what happens and then uh, we'll see what's happened we'll come into work tomorrow and decide what we're going to do there doesn't seem to be any kind of joined up plan here and gaming out situations you know there's a number of scenarios maybe there's only three or four responses well if there's only three or four responses what are the responses to do or three or four responses you know, and just walk through things. We don't seem to do any of that. And it's terrible. You know, I, I'm looking at the the pictures that we're seeing on our TV screens this morning, and I'm not. You know, I'm not going to be sold on it until I see it myself. We, we've seen it with, um, you know, we've actually just seen it happening with Eddie Howe. I'm looking at some of the odds coming in. Rafa Benitez, 16 to 1. 
no chance. Paul Lambert, 20 to 1. Um, Mark Hughes, 12 to 1, just for anybody who wants to stick a tenner on Sparky. Um, Henrik Larson, 25 to 1. But there are other managers. I mean, we've mentioned Lucien Favre uh, in the past before. There are people who, um, Wagner's been mentioned by Jared when he was on. There are managers available out there, Natasha, that I think, you know, would be better received. And I think Russell was speaking about this yesterday in relation to that. Um, I just think it's the timing. You know, if you're bringing, bringing in a progressive coach, as we did, or we thought we were doing with, with Ronnie Dyla, and people will say it did work because we won two leagues under Ronnie Dyla. Others would say it, it didn't. I think his legacy is the players that he developed um, who went on to, to be, become integral, integral parts of Brendan Rodgers' side. But at this moment in time, with so few days and weeks to go before our next our next game, there are what you would suggest or uh, assume to be kind of better bets at this moment in time. Um, I, as I said at the very top of the show, I will back the manager, whoever that manager may be. But I still think that Celtic are really going down a road here of no return. And if indeed we do a point, Ange, I really don't hold much hope in terms of this so-called charm offensive when it comes to season ticket sales as well, which is massive this season. Yeah, that's something I agree with. Um, no matter how many Tokyo-based journalists, Australian journalists, tell us how good an appointment Ange could be, Celtic fans still are going to look at this, quite rightly, as I do, and say this is a huge, huge gamble in a season that we really can't afford to take a huge gamble. We know what's up for stake this season. We know that in terms of the Champions League drawing the money that comes from that. The problem Celtic are facing now is that if you start going down the wrong path, it takes longer and longer to turn that around again. It's like an oil tanker. If you choose the wrong direction, it takes a lot longer to turn that back around. And if we do go down the wrong direction with Posta Coglu, then you're not just, you know, sacrificing this pre-season, you're sacrificing next season that takes a lot longer to get things back on track. And that's something that Celtic simply can't afford to do right now. That is not something that the fans would accept. We've seen the momentum this season swing towards the other direction. We need to start swinging them that back as soon as possible before it goes further in the wrong direction. And appointing the wrong manager won't help with that. Whether Postacoglu is the wrong manager remains to be seen, but for me, there's just that, such a massive risk there, and I think that's going to be really hard to overcome. I agree with that. Now, this is one coming in from Alan McFadden. Uh, it won't go over the head of Lawrence. It may go over the head of some of our younger uh, audience members, but Wagner hasn't done a thing since Heart to Heart. Stevie Clark's actually speaking about uh, tomorrow night's Friendly. Uh, Scotland are playing the Netherlands he has been quoted he's admitted that he spoke to the club uh, previously when we were looking for a manager there are other managers but we're in a situation also with the Euros coming up so you know it, it seems like we are in kind of desperate times I said last week or the week before that I feel as though uh, we've been set back by three or five years uh, we simply can't take three years to get this right. And I think that there's going to be a knock-on effect if the managerial position, um, uh, the appointment isn't the right one. I think there's going to be a knock-on effect, Natasha, on uh, Dominic Mackay because he's walking into this, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Even though Jared was saying he doesn't think this is a Peter Lowell production, I think most people are of the view that he has been hugely influential in bringing it to where it is right now. Yeah, Dominic Mackay hasn't actually taken over the role yet, so it has been Peter Lawwell all this way in terms of being involved in the managerial appointment and those negotiations, and that's something that Celtic have said themselves. So there's absolutely no doubt that Peter Lawwell has a hand in this, but it's going to be Dominic Mackay who's left to work with it. Um, in terms of getting the fans back on side, I think it's going to be very difficult. But like Lawrence has pointed out earlier, football is a very fickle game. If Ange comes in and he does well in the qualifiers and he has an amazing start to the league campaign, then we'll all be singing the praises of Ange and the board for bringing him in. That might be a stretch too far for some. But we will certainly be singing the praises of, of Ange if he does come in and do this brilliant job. We need to hit the ground running and Celtic fans won't accept anything less than that and the concern with an appointment like Posta Coglu is that we're going to need to give him time and we're going to need to be patient we're going to need to be patient in terms of the rebuild and watching that all gel together and the one thing you don't get at Celtic is very much patience and the one thing we don't have time for right now is patience and my concern aligns with yours that 
this is not a one year rebuild sort of job. This could be longer. But with the ma right managerial appointment and the right signings in terms of players, it could be shorter. So if we find the right manager, the right players, we can reduce the time that the rebuild is going to need. Whether we do that or not is will remain to be seen. Lawrence, I'm going to ask you this one. An interesting point Jared made. He didn't believe that it was a, a Peter Lowell um, production. He thought this is a Fergal Harkin one, and he believes that Fergal Harkin's the director of football. There are murmurings that that isn't going to be the case. Sean Maloney has been mentioned as coming back to Celtic. I'm going to throw something at you here uh, because this is the way Celtic seem to do things. What if we don't have a new manager in place? Uh, come the Champions League qualifiers? What if the manage managerial team is bolstered by Sean Maloney? What if we go into those uh, qualifiers and hope to scrape through them? Uh, because that's what we do at Celtic. Um, you know, rather than actually getting ourselves properly prepared for them, we try to go for the, the cheapest option and scrape through them and maximise the revenue. I mean, that for me is a possibility. Um, under the, the current circumstances. It would be an absolute disaster, but I still don't think I can write that off. It's, you, you, you can't write that off, but there's all, also the possibility we get a new manager in and we don't invest in the team again until after the qualifiers because structurally we haven't changed anything. The board hasn't changed. We've got Don McKay's the, a, a new name there, maybe a new director of football. But unless we change our processes and start preparing for things properly, does it really matter who the new manager's going to be? You know, if it's, uh, I think we, we need to see bigger kind of structural changes at the top of the movie process stuff. And part of that is saying, like, well, when do you cheer up, you know, gear up for the Champions League qualifier? Yeah, exactly. You know, or a Champions League group stage, do you do it after you've qualified and give yourself a two or three week window to get players in? Or do you do it when you're in the Europa League? <laughs> you know, oh, wait, I know. Wait a minute, that didn't work for how many years in a row? Exactly. But you know what, we're just going to keep approaching the same way. You certainly don't look at it about 50 days before the first fixture, whilst we've got the Euros to look at as well. Natasha, I think four transfer windows needed. I don't disagree with Jason. I think that um, this season, if nothing else, showed that bringing in six or seven players can often be very difficult uh, to, to bleed them into the team. If you're bringing in three or four at a time, it might well take three or four transfer windows to get this right now. Uh, we have already mentioned Fran Alonso. Natasha, talk to me about the Fran Alonso effect. I mean, you have been uh, at the game. You were at the game at the weekend. Fantastic. Hopefully we'll get you to the Motherwell game as well. What has he done? I mean, he's injected enthusiasm. He's basically got our buy-in, I think, Axel, uh, bought into Fran and bought into the women's team as well. Um, it worked hand in hand. And now we're sitting top of the league. Um, you know, the other week there I was going on about hopefully we can get a Champions League place. We might even win the league. It's coming right down to the last day, isn't it? Fill us, fill us in on what's been happening in the win women's game. So firstly, yeah, all credit to Fran Alonso, an infectious character, and you just have to watch him at the side of the park. I was lucky to get along to the game against Barford at the weekend, where the girls won 10-0, an absolutely incredible result, really. Um, and what you saw at the side of the park was Fran Alonso's enthusiasm, his encouragement. He never left the edge of that pitch and he didn't stop talking and encouraging the girls all game. If something didn't come off, it was more encouragement, it was more positivity, pointers on what we do next. He's infectious and being there at the game and listening to what he said and the instructions he was giving on was really valuable insight. And one thing that you see is his enthusiasm and his passion and his drive at the side of the park transfers onto the pitch and we see that in the girls and you just have to look back at some of the big results this season the three Glasgow Derby wins all won by the narrowest of margins in really tough games and it's that grit and drive and determination that has won those games and you can see that that comes from Fran Alonso at the side of the park so certainly all credit to him as manager in terms of where we stand at the moment we're in second position Glasgow City still top of the league and to be honest looking on course for their 14th title in a row which is simply an incredible achievement if you'd said at the start of this year that Celtic could get second and get Champions League football everyone would have agreed that that was an absolutely brilliant result in the circumstances so going into the last game of the season Glasgow City are playing Rangers Celtic are playing Motherwell. It's a game that Celtic are expected to win. If Celtic are to win the league, we would need Rangers to beat Glasgow City. I'll let people make their own minds up as to whether that will happen or not um, and how much effort we might see there. Um, 
it's unlikely that that would happen anyway, to be honest. Glasgow City are a very, very strong side, and I would put if I was betting on it, I would bet my money on Glasgow City to beat Rangers. If they didn't, if Rangers do win the game and Celtic overcome the current three goal deficit, then there is still the chance that Celtic can can win the league. Realistically, it is looking like second. Celtic still needs to go out and beat Motherwell. Motherwell are certainly towards the lower end of the table, so it is a game that Celtic should win. But they've put themselves right up there. They've taken mm. it to the wire. That 10-0 result against Forfar really did that. Before that game, the goal difference deficit was looking too big to overcome and it wouldn't really have meaningfully went into the last game of the season. But by scoring 10 goals there, we have taken it to the last game of the season effectively. And that came from something really interesting from Fran Alonso is that at halftime, it was 5-0. He told the girls that he was seeing the second half as a new game. He told them that it was a new game for him, a clean slate, and they were starting a 45-minute game 4-0 down. And he said he wouldn't be happy unless they came off the pitch having won that game. So what they needed to go and do in the second half was score five goals. And you saw it, even in the 88th minute, we were still attacking, attacking, playing quick football. And it was an interesting tactic that certainly worked because they went on and scored another five goals, winning 10-0 and decimating that goal difference with Glasgow City, taking it right down to the final game against Motherwell on the 6th of June. It's going to be live on the BBC Sport website. I'd encourage everyone to tune in and, and watch what's going to be a very exciting game for the girls. I've got a question for you on this, Natasha, because I'm new to the game. Uh, I don't mm. profess to have been, you know, watching women's football for five, six years. I'm new to it. This season has been my introduction. And I find it interesting that, for example, Emma Hayes, uh, Chelsea women's manager, is has been linked to uh, professional jobs in the man's sport, in the men's sport. Uh, you know, and uh, I think it was uh, Andy Townsend recently said that it's only a matter of time before uh, a women's uh, team has a manager who transfers to a man's professional team. Now, when you look at that situation, you look at the job that Fran Alonso has done, uh, Champions League football would be fantastic for the for the club, um, for the women's team. Um, I would expect, because of the job he's done, for there to be suitors all around Fran Alonso. Do you think that it would work both ways? Do you think the, the men's sport would look at the job he's done in the women's game and think we might actually get him in for an interview. He might be the man for our job. I know that he's got uh, experience, obviously, in the, ma in the man's game before. Yeah, it is. He has experience down in England. He worked um, in Liverpool. He worked at Everton. He worked at Southampton. So he does have experience in the men's game. But for him, and I asked him about this, about the transition to the women's game, his you know, view is that it's, it's still football. There's different challenges, as she would have in any team, but it's still football. The principles are still the same. There's some nuanced differences that he explained um, on my interview with him. If anyone wants to go and have a watch of that, it's on the State of Mind YouTube channel. But it's really interesting insight to some slight differences, but the overarching view is it's the same game. Mm -hmm. What you can really tell with Fran, though, is that he's passionate about women's football. He's not only passionate about Celtic, which he's completely bought into, but he's passionate about women's football and the development of the women's game in terms of facilities, in terms of professionalism, in terms of the league. So for me, I think that Fran is going to stay in women's football. I think that it's something that he sees his career advancing in. But there's certainly no reason why someone who has been a women's football coach couldn't then become a man's football coach and vice versa. We talked about Emma Hayes. She was linked to the Wimbledon job mm -hmm. and when she was asked about that she considered that a step down and quite rightly she's managing Chelsea right now who just competed in the Champions League final who have some of the best female footballers in the world why would she give up that role to go and coach with no disrespect why would she go give up that role to go and coach Wimbledon not least for the fact that she alluded to that they couldn't afford her so I think one thing we see with Fran Alonso as well, every time that he's mentioned, you get the comments on social media, oh, we should take him to the men's team. One that came in recently is, oh, we should give him the top job. He already has the top job. He is managing the women's team. We don't want to take a talent away from the women's team to support the men's team. He's doing an excellent job there. He's happy in his job and he's doing very well at it. So... All credit to him and all credit to the job that the girls are doing this season. And I certainly look forward to seeing where it can take us next season. Looking forward to the weekend, Natasha. Hopefully we get in there and we get um, live updates from 
the game as well. I know Lawrence has bought into the women's sport in a big way this season as well. It's been a tremendous uh, return to action uh, on Axom. It was a quiet weekend, so I'm glad to be back <laughs> in the saddle. And it was nice that uh, Jared joined us all the way from Melbourne. And hopefully he'll be back at some point uh, during the pre-season or maybe next season. But uh, thanks everybody for getting involved on YouTube, Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you to Natasha Miko and Lawrence Conley for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind.